All right, welcome everyone to the second to last panel of the day. Um, we are here talking about state clemency. I am I'm Jenny Sobel, I'm the executive director of the Illinois Prison Project. And I'm incredibly excited and honored and humbled to be, I think, among some real giants in the work of state, state clemency, resentencing, post-conviction, and creative lawyering throughout the country. Um, I'm going to do some brief introductions so folks know who we're talking to today. And then um, just as we're doing with all of the panelists today, I'm going to ask our um, wonderful folks to talk a little bit about what Second Chances mean to them and a little bit about their work. And then we will get into it. Um, the vast majority of people who are incarcerated in this country are incarcerated in state prisons. Um, we have 50 jurisdictions, which means we have 50 distinct criminal legal systems to navigate here. Um, more than 50, thinking about District of Columbia, have its own really unique system as well. Um, and so the bulk of the work is in state work. Um, and although each of our systems is its own beast and its own animal with its own creative, with its own really horrible problems and really creative solutions, there are a bunch of threads that um, unite this work and I think unite the people working in it. So with no further ado, I'm really excited to introduce you to um, ben Feinholt, who is the director of the Just Sentencing Project at the Wilson Center for Science and Justice at Duke Law. Ben uses data, advocacy, and strategic litigation to reduce long-term incarceration in North Carolina prisons, and has been really focused on the juvenile LWAP population. I also want to introduce you to Steve Drizzen, who's the clinical professor of law at Northwestern Pittsburgh School of Law's Bloom Legal Clinic, and the co-director of the clinic's renowned Center of Wrongful Convictions. He's also the founder of their project on youth, um, and a podcast host, and a member of my board, and a wonderful human and lawyer. Um, David Singleton is the executive director of the Ohio Justice Policy Center, um, where he launched the really visionary and groundbreaking Beyond Justice, uh, Beyond Guilty, not Beyond Justice, although it is Beyond Justice, the Beyond Guilty Project, which looks at and has had really remarkable success freeing people who have been over sentenced um, in Ohio. He's also a professor of law at the Northern Kentucky University, uh, Salem P. Chase College of Law. And finally, we are joined by Steve Seidman um, of Cooney School of Law, where he works, Steve works with law students to assist people in prison who are seeking to extricate themselves from life and long-term sentences. Steve has also had a couple of really amazing, um, really amazing wins recently. So I'm excited to hear him talk about his work. Um, so I'm just gonna go left to right, who's on my screen, and maybe Steve Drizzen, we can start with you. Tell us a little bit about your work and what second chances mean to you. So my work with Second Chances really began um, when I was working primarily in the juvenile court, which um, in 1999, it was the 100th anniversary of the juvenile court. And we were really trying to use that anniversary to reinvigorate the idea of Second Chances for young people um, and to kind of preserve the juvenile court and strengthen it because the court itself was originally conceived to be essentially an opportunity to give kids uh, a second chance uh, to make better choices. Um, that work then led to parole work, um, basically for juvenile offenders who had been convicted as adults, and then clemency work, both pardon work and commutation work, um, with a youth focus, but not entirely a youth focus. Uh, and what second chances means to me is it's the right for someone who is incarcerated to reclaim their narrative, their life narrative, to redefine oneself in, in a way that is different from the criminal justice system has defined them in the worst moment of their life. So human beings are dynamic, they evolve, and the notion of second chances allows us to look at people over time and to give them an opportunity to say, this is who I really am. This is who I've become. This is who I want to be. Yeah, thanks for that. We've heard a lot of um, comments about reclaiming people's narratives and maybe even introducing them for the very first time as part of this process. How about you, David? Welcome to the panel. Thank you. <clears throat> So what second chance means to me 
I come to that question as a former public defender. And with that frame in mind, second chance is really shorthand. It's shorthand for giving people opportunities, no matter how many we're talking about. Maybe it's a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth, and so on and so on to be the to be recognized as the human being that they are. That's what second chance means to me. Uh, you know, through my work, not only as a public defender, but now at the Ohio Justice and Policy Center and with the Beyond Guilt Project, we help people who've been thrown away and just want to have their humanity affirmed. Yeah, they want freedom. Absolutely, they want freedom. They want another opportunity to walk amongst us in the community, but they want their humanity to be recognized and affirmed. And so that is what second chance, that concept means to me. And it's why I do this work. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. I think it's why a lot of us do this work. Thanks for your perspective. How about you, Steve Seidman? Welcome to the panel. Yeah, glad to be here. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, everyone, for bringing us together. If I can just real quickly, I hope folks heard um, Mark Osler's litany about the reasons for clemency. I think that should be required reading in high schools, colleges, law schools. But um, so it was about seven years ago that uh, I received an email that went out to all New York law school criminal law professors from a solo practitioner who was representing a woman named Judy Clark, who was serving 75 to life. And the email basically said, I've been trying to get this person a second look, a second chance. And I, I hit a wall and I need someone else to take a look. And I wrote back saying, um, I, know, I know of the case. I am by no means an expert, but if no one else will, I'll give it a shot. And then it became, yeah, you know, please do. And, you know, in the course of doing that work, um, entering this kind of territory, I did what most people would do in that situation. I reached out to people across New York State saying, who is familiar with clemency work? Who can send me a template? And in short order, I learned that there was nobody. Uh, it's just, it's a vast unmet need. We throw people away. We don't look at them once they do their direct appeals, in particular past post-conviction appeals. So uh, in the law school where I teach, I get about 30 to 35 new students every January. I have them for 12 to 18 months. We begin to work with people trying to extricate themselves from life and long-term sentences. Um, you know, we've received over 2,300 requests for help just in New York State alone. So the need is vast. Um, you know, so as a result of that, what does second look mean to me? Um, you know, I think about it this way, and it's evolving, I have to say, and it's been evolving just as a result of listening to what everyone else has had to say, to what Steve has said, what David has said, and panelists earlier. But I, you know, I think we recognize, and I say we, the collective we, we recognize that mass incarceration is a problem. But then what do we do about it? And it seems to me that the reforms that get suggested are all, they tend to be prospective. You know, get rid of three strikes, get rid of mandatory minimums. Get, but what about the living embodiment, the black and brown people who populate the jails and prisons, the explosion that came right after the civil rights movement in the 1960s? So I think for me, second looks are about addressing uh, that reality, the, expo the explosion in the prison population. And while we refer to it clemency, in particular, as this power of the executive, I think about it these days more as a duty and as an obligation. So for me, second looks are less about mercy, beneficence, or even transformation, and are just a, more about a moral need to rectify, to undo the damage that's been done. That's the lens through which I, I, I think about or look at. That's a really sort of, for me, like earth-shaking reframing of the question. I think a lot of us think about clemency as an ask as opposed to a demand or a right. And so thinking about that as something that executives and governors and presidents should, should feel required to do, I think is really a transformative um, way to think about things. All right, Ben. Ben, welcome to the panel. Thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about Second Chances Mean to You? Yeah, thanks uh, all for having me again. And uh, while I was on and then I got kicked off, Apparently, the Duke uh, intranet isn't what it used to be. Uh, but um, 
I mean, to me, I think that, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I believe all the same things that we've heard over the past uh, day, but it's also, I'm, I'm very data driven. And uh, one of the, one of the things that I always think about is that second chances are a way to um, basically find people who have been intentionally forgotten um, by the criminal legal system and by society. Um, I mean, I think that we, you know, the move away from parole and the move towards more extreme sentencing has been, I, I, I would say, basically an, an intentional move to take people who we don't want to think about and put ourselves in a place where we don't have to think about them. We lock them up, we throw away the key and they're gone. Um, and it's really pain, you know, because, and I think part of the reason is that, that frankly, it's really, it, you know, it would be really painful for people to day in and day out, think about what we are doing, particularly to our black and brown brothers and sisters, uh, in terms of warehousing them in carceral facilities and in terms of disposing of them. Um, and so we don't, we don't do it. We don't, we don't, that it's, it's just really, you know, if for all of us, we've had those times when it's just really painful to think about what's been done to one of our clients, and there are thousands of people like that. So that one of the things I, I focus on is the fact that using second chances and finding people worthy of second chances is a way to draw our attention back to those forgotten folks and a way not to forget about the actions that we as a society have taken um, and as a way to, to start the healing process from there. Yeah, that's, that's really poignant. And, you know, I was going to start somewhere else, but it, it's, it's driving me to start with the, a, a really sort of fundamental question, which is how do we pick cases? How do we decide which case we're going to bring? And I thought Steve shake his head a little bit and I feel it. So maybe I'll, I'll start with you, but I really want to open all of these questions up to everybody. So feel free to jump in. I think that's the single hardest part of my job, you know, I, and I, I think it's a mistake to go into this work, you know, trying to cream the best cases off the top. Um, for me, it's looking for a case where I can, where I can tell a st story that has a, a narrative arc. And whether that person has committed a violent crime, and most of the cases that I think most of us are working on are cases involving violence um, uh, or not, I want to be able to tell a story that it gives me the opportunity to, to you know, put the crime in context and put the offender in context. Um, so it, I don't, I don't have any hard or fixed rules. I do like to have clients who are willing to do the hard work that I think is necessary to create a good clemency petition. I want them to do some work in telling their own story. I want them to reflect on the events that led them into this mess. And I want them to be able to try to, to talk about how they wrestle with, you know, the consequences of their actions. Um, but that's about all I can say. I mean, I, I don't, I, I think it is, it is a mistake to say, I'm only gonna take X kinds of cases or Y kinds of cases, because there are incredible stories in all of these cases. Yeah, yeah, I would jump in and echo what Steve just said. It's hard. That's the hardest part of what we do. And um, and Steve Zeidman, yeah, you know, we I can relate to what you just said earlier about the flood of requests for help. And we've got so many people with so many stories. And the narrative arc is there in in almost all of the stories that we get from people. It's just there. And so then how do you decide? Uh, which way to go forward. So it does, it's, it's just hard. What I would say we do is um, we lean into the cases where people have committed the most serious crimes. Uh, that is something th that that's important. 
to Beyond Guilt. It's important to the Ohio Justice and Policy Center because those are the people who are even more written off. I mean, you know, if you're in prison, you're written off uh, to a large extent. Uh, the longer you're in, the more likely it is you've been written off. But the, the, the folks who've committed violent crimes uh, or, or serving time for violent crimes are, you know, you know the, the people that society in many respects is least um, uh, interested in seeing come home. So those are the people that we have chosen to stand with by and large. And it doesn't mean that folks who are serving long sentences for nonviolent crimes uh, or less serious crimes don't deserve to come home, but there are people championing th their freedom and not as many uh, folks fighting to make sure that people uh, who've committed a violent crime um, can be seen as the human being that they are and are des deserving of the opportunity to come home. Yeah, if I could jump in there as well too, just echoing, yeah, just echoing what David said. To me, it's it's a deliberate effort. You know, there's this discussion often about, well, what is a violent crime and society overdefines it. And I understand that, but the people we work with were convicted of violent crimes. Um, they are people, we don't have, it's not about an issue of innocence we're looking at people who are really facing death by incarceration that without clemency, their minimum is so long that they're going to perish behind bars. And we're trying both with the individual, but also at, in, at the macro level to force the conversation about how much time must someone do for an admittedly violent crime, including homicide. So it's sort of like taking up the mantle that the sentencing project has put out there and the, the argument, the issue they've raised so clearly that if we're serious about decarceration, we have to address people convicted of violent crimes. And that's what we're trying to do with each person. So it, our, our criteria, violent crime, uh, guilt, um, facing death by incarceration, we don't carve out law enforcement victims, sex offenses, multiple homicides. Um, we don't go into categories either, like, the elderly only, or people who are ill, or people who are young. It's, you know, trying to, again, force the issue to this question. It's certainly one I get all the time when I deal with clemency applications from the governor's people. You know, there are a lot of people out there who think you took two lives, you should never walk free. And so it's really trying to force that conversation to the forefront. Yeah. And yeah, I'm gonna, and put, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, go. I was going to say, I'm going to come back to you with a question about data in one second, because yeah. I, I think that's where I think that's where you want to go. But before we do that, a bunch of folks have raised this idea of a narrative arc. And I think everyone on this panel knows what we're talking about here. But I want to make sure that everybody who's listening understands what what folks mean when they talk about a narrative arc and building a narrative arc, because it's so crucial to bringing forth a really successful petition that no matter how you define success, whether it has a good shot of resulting in freedom or whether you mean um, helps the person you are working with feel seen and have their story told in an effective manner. So does somebody want to maybe speak just for a couple of seconds about what you mean by a narrative arc and what goes into that process? Yeah, I, I mean, my, my formulation yeah. has always been sort of in three parts. Um, and I, I, you know, nothing is as simple as you, <laughs> as you try to break it down. But, you know, basically, we're always looking at what, what got the person to the point where they did commit in did in fact commit the crime that they committed which is generally not a great uh thing to do so how'd they get to the point where they're committing the crime and particularly if you're looking at people under the age of 25 you know or uh, you know a 15 year old for example like not most 15 year olds are not involved in serious crime and so how did this person get to that point and then once they went into uh, incarceration what have they done with their time since then um, you know, that, and there's a lot of factors that go into that, you know, I mean, uh, there was a lot of talk in the, one of the federal panels about uh, disciplinary, um, your disciplinary record, and, that, and that's always important, but the classes you take and degrees you can earn and jobs you hold. And then of the final piece is, the final piece of that arc that I always look at is what, if this person gets released, what is their community support look like? What, um, you know, do they have a place to live? Are they going to have transportation? I mean, there's some very just sort of basic practical details that people who are 
reviewing clemency applications are, you know, not, not surprisingly interested in, you know, uh, releasing a person in homelessness is not a win. Uh, it, it might be a win for our client in some ways, but, you know, that's just going to not get you very far with a clemency decision maker. So, you know, how they get how they get to the point where they committed the crime? What have they done since? And what would they do if they're released are always the three things that I'm thinking about. We I we train pro bonos all the time. And one thing that we uh, talk about and we have a whole, you know, CLE discussion around is storytelling and how to write a position that reads like a novel as opposed to like a legal brief. Because part of our goal in clemency work and in all of in all of these sort of um, back end mechanism efforts is to bring our clients to life on an otherwise very inhumane sort of two dimensional page. And how do you how do you make a three a, a very real person three dimensional on the page? Um, Steve and Steve and David have talked about. Um, sort of fielding individual requests for representation and, and working on individual cases. I know, Ben, you take a really different um, approach to how you, you pick your cases, and maybe there are different goals behind that animate that approach, and I wonder if you could talk about that for a second. Yeah, I, I mean, so, uh, you know, I came to the work uh, from North Carolina Prisoner Legal Services, where it was all folks writing to us, you know, 100 letters a day, um, asking for any number uh, of different kinds of help, um, whether it was conditions of confinement or criminal post-conviction help. And, um, uh, you know, the, the difficulty was that that's a, it's just a very resource intensive process. I mean, there's no way around it. It's, I mean, you're going, if you're going to do this kind of work, you have to, at some point, get to the point where you're expending a lot of resources, right? Like there, if we were all just submitting lists of awesome people to governors and have them looking at it and going like, yeah, this looks great. Thanks. Um, you know, we wouldn't need a symposium about this. Um, so at some point you're digging into these people's stories and, and telling that arc. Um, but again, getting to the point where we're creating large scale change, you know, for, for me has meant using a very data-driven approach. And so uh, particularly, you know, this was, was part of my shift as I was at Prisoner Legal Services and sort of have basically completed that shift now at Duke is to find, figure out, you know, first who's in prison, what they are in prison for, how long they're expected to serve, and then try to, I mean, in a, in a certain way, just start at the top. Who are the people who at least sort of on paper, based on, you know, how, how old they, any number of factors, how old they were when they were convicted, what their conviction was for, you know. Um, so if you find someone who was 15 uh, at the time of the incident and was convicted of armed robbery in North Carolina in the 70s and has still been in 40 years later and only has two infractions, I mean, that's some stuff on paper that is very appealing right off the top. And so just being able to look at data to at least identify this, you know, just the sentence alone seems really out of whack with the way we think about sentencing now can be at least a starting point uh, for, for me as I try to uh, find a way into identifying people whose stories I do want to tell, because you do have to do that. But again, if, you know, if, if if you if just the sort of like letter reading process is, is really hard and really intensive. And so this is another way to, to get yourself into that process by using uh, data. And we're lucky. I mean, North Carolina, the Department of Public Safety who runs the prisons makes a, a, a lot of data on everyone who's ever been in their custody for, you know, almost 40 years at this point, public available. And so that's where we, that's where I've started. We do a similar thing at IPP. We we go through the Illinois data, which is also very publicly available and easy to access. And we've called a group of groups of clients with similar sort of convictions and sentences and have brought individual cases, but with sort of a group dynamic. So that we bring lots and lots of cases within reach instead of just um, accepting folks who've reached out to us. Sort of a, a flip on its head a little bit. Um, I, I want to go a little out of order and jump into a question that's in the chat um, because it is it does really address this idea of narrative building and working on an individual case and that that that's the idea of restorative justice and so someone says how much does the humanity of the black and brown victims of crime play into these decisions are they supportive of clemency petitions do they have a voice in the process 
And I think I want to ask about less the process with the governor's office or the sentencing judge and more with our sort of internal processes we're representing folks um, and thinking and bringing restorative justice principles into our own work. So I wonder if there are folks on this, um, among this group who have been thinking about restorative justice and actively bringing it into their process. I'm happy to jump uh, to that. Uh, yes. the, an the answer is yes in, uh, in cases where we have the support or been able to obtain the support of the family members of the person who was um, killed. Uh, we have a case right now, actually it's in, in Minneapolis where it, it's a very powerful, and actually Steve, Steve's colleague, um, Lauren Eyrider is representing the, mur the, the murder victim's uh, mother while we're trying to get um, our, our, our client, the incarcerated person, Jerome Nunn, out. And the voice of uh, Abdul Paul, who was killed, the voice of his mother has been just enormously powerful in persuading the elected prosecutor, Mike Freeman in Minneapolis, to uh, ask the court to release uh, Jerome. Uh, we've run into a, 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 a hiccup with the judge uh, who's questioning whether he has jurisdiction to do it. But, and that's not a, in the clemency context, but the, the, the voices of, of, of um, loved ones who've been killed uh, can matter in our cases. It can really matter. But the thing though that I would counsel against is only taking cases where that support exists uh, because we won't get too many people out if that is our criteria. It is helpful when, when it exists, uh, but we, most of the people we represent don't have the murder victim's uh, mother or father or family members uh, championing our client's release. You know, Jenny, one of the things you had asked in sort of our pre-meeting about what does not work in a clemency application. Yeah. You know, early on, uh, there was someone, someone we've still been working with for a number of years now, and the governor's counsel's office said, there's such strong victim opposition, this case is a non-starter. And, and to David's point, we're trying to push back against that. Um, I'll say this, the restorative justice piece, we reached out to Danielle Sered's organization, the, the advantage of it being here in New York, uh, Common Justice. And what was interesting to me is her folks who came to talk to our law students about how do you call someone, because we're talking about 30 years after, after the murder. And how do you send an email, call a letter to a victim's family? And it was interesting to hear those people from the restorative justice world who are so familiar and well-versed in this practice say like, wow, you know, what we're doing in our common justice program, these are people who were just harmed. And the prosecutor, the defense lawyer, and the person who caused the harm, we say, do you get to get, you're talking, making a call 30 years later to which can re-traumatize bring up all sorts of trauma, for lack of a better word. So we've, we've tried. I don't think we're particularly good at it, but I think there's such a, a crying need for it. If we could figure out how to better bring the restorative justice movement into this work, I think we'd have fewer cases where there were victims who just speak to law enforcement or someone in the governor's office and say that person should never get out. I think, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it is... Um... It is really scary 30 years after the fact to reach into the world and stir a pot that might have felt oh, yeah. a little bit more settled. You know, this raises a really good question in the, in the chat, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna send, send to Steve Drizen first. How do you handle clients who have good claims of actual innocence in their clemency petitions? Um, you know, I know in our work, at least, we really urge folks to you know, remorse, responsibility, rehabilitation, and that's really hard for folks who have actual innocence claims. It is extraordinarily <laughs> challenging. I think one of the, the one of the good developments that, that I've seen over the last 10 years, and it's probably been because of the successes of 
the various innocence organizations in Illinois is that there are you know, a good number of people on the prisoner review board who understand that there are innocent people behind bars who, who are trying to get out and really don't expect, I, mean, I can't say this about everybody on the prisoner review board, but they, they don't expect someone to give up their claim of innocence you know, in an effort to um, try to appease board members. And I would never ask a client to do that. I just think, I think that's a, a mistake because it won't come off across as genuine. Um, and the way to deal with it is, is, is that you tell the narrative of innocence, but that's not the whole story. The story is about, you know, um, actions speaking louder than words, right? Anyone can say that they're remorseful for a crime, but if you've demonstrated over years through your accomplishments, through your writings, through your artwork, through your behavior in prison, through you know, any number of ways that demonstrate that you're not the same person that you were when you were caught in this mess to begin with, um, and you've demonstrated consistently over time that you've maintained your innocence, I think that's a much better posture to, to go before the board in. Um, you know. But it's a challenge. We, um, I represented a person who is actually innocent, was a bird torture survivor, and innocence, innocence was a footnote. It was a footnote in a very long and um, adversarial and ugly um, clemency process, which is unusual for them to have, you know, any real back and forth. But this one was pretty brutal. Um, I remember and, it well. And I, I, I also, <laughs> I, I mean, I would also say just that, like, you can you can take responsibility for any number of things and show remorse for any number of things without saying I was the one who pulled the trigger. Um, you know, there are, there are lots of, I mean, you know, I just, uh, some of my favorite clients have been the ones who have said like, look, I didn't do it, but was I acting like a fool? Was I doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing? Yes. Was it all my fault? No, I was sort of, I was being left on the streets on my own, but like, of course, if I could go back, I would make different choices. It would have been really hard for me to eat without dealing drugs at the time, but like, I would have loved to have find a way to have done that. And I can take responsibility for some of my actions related to that. Um, and, and, and I think that that helps too, because it's not just, I don't know what you're talking about. This is all nonsense, you know, I, cause I do agree. Like that would be a difficult stance. Now, on the other hand, if it's all nonsense, I also don't know, like you gotta, you gotta speak your truth too. If it's all completely nonsense and this is a, I, you know, I don't know how it, came to be, then you got to say that too. Cause otherwise, you know, and, and David said this when he answered uh, a question in the chat, but like the worst, the only thing you cannot be is inauthentic because that will just get seen through immediately. And then you've got no shot. And Jenny, can I add a footnote to the question about innocence? Please. Well, when we started doing this work, we were advised by people in other jurisdictions who did it, you know, that the governor's office, they don't want you to relitigate the case. And so innocence is one thing, and we shied away from legal issues that we found in the trial transcript that had already been appealed for the most part and denied. Um, and we've changed our minds about that. And with a fair amount of, we've gotten some traction, some people who did get clemency saying things like, I'll give you one example, a matter we're working on now. This was a trial 35 years ago in a well-to-do county in New York where there was an all white jury, the prosecutor did everything conceivable to remove the few black jurors. The defendant, a black man accused of killing a white man, real ID issues, high profile case, and the challenges um, were denied on appeal, but they've resonated with the people in the governor's office. They wanna know more about it. So innocence obviously is an issue, but I also think if you're doing clemency work, combing through the trial, the entire trial transcript, and we shouldn't run away from legal issues and quote, relitigating without actually saying that's the main reason for clemency. But I do think it can be a very heavy thumb on the scale. Yeah, that's so interesting. And sort of brings me back to something that um, 
I, now I can't remember if it was in this panel or another panel, but one of it was another panel that one of the purposes is, of clemency is to re-examine practices, whether they're sentences or sort of court practices that were acceptable 40, 50 years ago, but now feel abhorrent. Right. And then it's a way to sort of re reify our updated values. Yeah, and I think that's the problem when we just hammer the word transformation over and over and over. We ignore the fact that we know the criminal legal system, it's not only innocence, we know that how many, especially those of us who are public defenders can talk about the sham trials we, we know firsthand. So I, I think it's also important to bring those to the light, not make it all about how many certificates your client achieved, but to call out all the wrongs that happened. That's a great point, that's a great point. Well, so let's talk about what happens when commutation doesn't work, because as I think all of us know, it's um, nobody's, nobody's got a good batting average here. It's just the way that the system works and we all lose more than we win. Um, so, so what do you do if you're in a place where either commutation isn't working for your client, your group of clients, or maybe you're in a state where commutation doesn't function at all? And um, maybe, David, I'll start with you because I think you might be in in such a place. Well, one thing I would say, uh, Jenny, is you've got, a, you've got a pretty good batting average. Um, and uh, we, we look up to you for what for what you're doing in Illinois. I got to admit, there's a part of me that's jealous um, because it's, it's and, and actually, let me say this, because it, it, um, what you do, what you're doing in Illinois is totally groundbreaking. And it's hard. It's hard even when you have a, a good governor uh, for these issues. It's um, in Ohio, we've got to figure out a way to build towards what, what, what you've done because our governors here are very reluctant to use their clemency power to free uh, people serving sentences for something serious. Occasionally it'll happen, but it's incredibly rare. And, and, it's, and it's certainly far from what Steve Zeidman was talking about earlier, which is governors that feel like it's a duty uh, to, to, to do this. So um, with a few, few exceptions, we have focused a lot of our energy on trying to, to find creative avenues out um, for people getting back to court even when jurisdiction can be questionable. And for that, we have really relied on um, on prosecutors uh, to be supportive. And, and, and uh, the one thing I'd say about that is you don't have to have a so-called progressive prosecutor to make some headway. Uh, in the county where uh, I do the most of, most of my work is uh, where Cincinnati is, it's Hamilton County, we've got the opposite of a progressive prosecutor. We've got a prosecutor who brags about sending more people to death row than any other prosecutor in the state. Yet, he also has a soft spot for the idea that people can be over punished. And so we have worked collaboratively with his office to have them go to the mat when we file a motion for a new trial that's incredibly thin. And he's gone to the mat to go with, by going to the court, going to the judge, meeting in chambers with us and saying, judge, the right thing here is to let Singleton's client out and we will not appeal you. We're gonna join this motion. So I would say, um, and that's one thing that we do. We also represent people at parole hearings, which also can feel like it's it's futile, but we're starting to make a difference there in terms of getting more people out. Um, and so what I would say to people is, don't assume that just because your prosecutor is um, a hard ass, that you can't get through to that person on the story, uh, an emotional story on why your client deserves to be in the community. Um, don't give up on that because people will surprise you and we have been surprised. And I think that also means we need to keep coming back to our governor and, and, and trying to move the governor um, uh, on these issues. We should not give up. But right now we do a lot of our work in the trial courts 
with the help of prosecutors. Um, you talked about going to your prosecutor and convincing him or her that your client should come home. For those of us who um, are thinking about new prosecutors, new contacts, maybe ones that have not been particularly receptive, how does that conversation look? How, what, how do you frame those? Maybe um, David or Steve, um, Steve D, I know that's something you've been thinking about and working on lately. Um, how does that look? Well, I think one thing that is useful is, is to demonstrate to new prosecutors that other prosecutors have gone down this road before. So there's no problem with me showing a prosecutor in Cook County that a prosecutor in Will County has used their revestment powers or their powers under the new second look sentencing act to um, work constructively to right size, if you will, somebody's sentence. That gives prosecutors a certain level of, of comfort. Um, you know, if you're unable to get a commutation from the governor, there are still alternatives short of a commutation that you should always ask for in the alternative. I mean, what you want here is the opportunity to make your case anywhere you can. And the fact of the matter is, especially in election years, just a reality, the governor may not be in a place where he can do all that you hope or want him to do in the clemency space. But what he can do is he commute, can commute someone's sentence significantly. He can cut a 35 year sentence to a 15 year sentence. I had that happen in a case. It wasn't the whole ball of wax, but I'm, I'm telling you, my client is in a completely different mind space now because she can see light at the end of the tunnel. Or you can have them say, I'm not going to commute your sentence, but I'm going to commute your sentence to make you parole eligible, right? And then you now have the opportunity to make your case in front of the parole board. And, you know, You've got the prosecutor option in Illinois, you know, when the clemency process doesn't work, you have to change the ground rules and, and you, Jenny, and other advocates have done that with things like, you know, the second look resentencing laws and the um, juvenile parole laws. And then you can still work within the clemency context to at least give your, your client an opportunity to get out from under these these sentences. I invite prosecutors to come meet my client. Um, it, it, it Steve, it Steve Driven taught me, and we worked together on a case called Tyra Patterson. You can look up Tyra sometime for those of you who, are, who don't know who she is. But Steve uh, said something that I will always uh, keep with me, uh, and that is that the people we represent are their own best advocates. Now, may there be such a situation where that is not true? Yes. But where we represent people who really truly are their own best advocates, there's no substitute for me telling that uh, person's story for them. And I've had some prosecutors uh, to take, take me up on that. And it can make a huge difference, whether you're trying to get the prosecutor to be supportive for clemency efforts, or whether you're trying to get the, the prosecutor to be supportive for some revisiting of the sentence. Yeah, that's really brilliant. That's really, really brilliant. And I think something that I, had you not just said that, would have been afraid to try. And so thank you for sort of pushing us all a little bit out of our comfort zone. Um, ben, I want to ask you, because I know this is something you're working on right now, when we're sort of thinking about the long haul, because as Steve mentioned, we're in an election year here in Illinois. I think a lot of folks are not expecting too much from um, in the way of gubernatorial grants, at least for the next couple of months. What do we do to build robust structures that don't depend on a single actor? How can we um, work as advocates or as uh, policymakers or in any capacity to, to sort of support structures that create mechanisms for release? Yeah, I think that's um, like the more I've been thinking about this recently, I, I'm into sort of the, a, a parallel process approach where you identify some folks who 
you think are really deserving and start working on their cases while at the same time thinking about what the mechanisms would be um, looking at your state, figuring out what mechanism, mechanisms do exist, how those people might fit within those existing mechanisms. And then I'm a big fan of just inventing stuff when it when there isn't anything. Um, I mean, my you know, when we were at when I was a prisoner legal services, every time we had somebody whose prior points were added up wrong, we would just send a uh, an, an order to the prosecutor that we could all sign and hand to a judge that just said, oh, we're going to correct your math mistake and doing the work for people just made it much easier. And so, um, you know, I mean, that's like one of the things I did was write an executive order that Governor Cooper ended up signing. And I just think that if this is a real uh, be the change you want to see in the world opportunity for us, where if you are looking at your existing mechanisms and you think that they are insufficient and, and, you know, this goes to one of the, this question that's in the, that's in the Q and a right now is, you know, do we, is it a good idea to remove the responsibility from a governor? I, so I think that you look at your own circumstances and we were in the same way, you know, last year, governor Cooper was running for reelection and he, I, you know, I think he rightly or wrongly, I, I don't know because I wanted him to be elected. And so I don't know what it would have done to his election, re-election chances, didn't really want to do clemency. And so one of the things, you know, for us, it was looking at it and saying, well, how can we, how can we make that easier for him? And, and this idea called the juvenile sentence review board was, so look at your own state and say, um, is is this do we have a legislature that we can work with you know for for me in north carolina that's not the case but the governor's office was a group we could work with do we have a prisoner review board do we have a uh parole board or parole commission that we think we can work with and then just do write the policy that you want to see adopted um and write the executive order that you want to see signed and that's not gonna, I mean, you know, writing the new statute doesn't mean that the, I mean, the North Carolina General Assembly is not passing any statutes that I write at this time. But again, you have at least done part of the work um, and, and, and being strategic about which parts of that work you do, I think are really important. So you want to, you want to, you want to be the person who is shaping what's happening rather than just encouraging other people to do it. In, in my view, that just is what has worked for me more often. And I think the same goes for, you know, building a pro bono network is really helpful too. again, go out and do the recruiting and talk to law schools and find someone who has ins with firms so that you can build a system for helping folks out once you've got a process in place that could help them. I think it's, you're sort of, unfortunately, right? Like we're, you have to do all of it. You have to prepare a couple of great petitions so that people know what a great clemency advocate, you know, advocacy looks like. And then you have to actually write the policy that you want to see adopted. And then you have to activate the pro bono. But, you know, that is the truth that you, you I mean, you're going to have to sort of pursue all the different paths available to you if you want to see change. Yeah, Jenny, if I can jump in there just about change, yeah. too, because um, a bunch of us have been trying to think, and I know this may seem simplistic, but why is it that the governor won't grant clemency? And we can talk about, and I know it came up earlier, Willie Horton being soft on crime and the like, but I just want to give one, maybe this is kind of a very optimistic view, but one of the things we've recognized over time, certainly in New York, there's this expectation come Christmas Eve that this is the day, this is the announcement. And there's this expectation that builds, it creates all sorts of hope from people inside their families, but it also puts this political pressure on it because the media starts calling around December 1st saying, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? So we've been advocating for the longest time with the governor's people, two different governors, mind you, saying, if you normalize this, if you regularize this, if you did it on an ongoing basis, it would, not, it would be a non-starter. So if someone merited clemency on December 24th, surely they deserved it November 3rd, July 15th. And if it, you know, if you just sort of, well, and the reason I mention this is while Governor Hochul, our brand new governor, granted all of one sentence commutation on December 24th, the client of ours, I'm thrilled for him, but one is mind blowing. But what she did state in a very public way is a commitment to ongoing clemency grants, which is a major step forward. Because I think if we can get to that place, it doesn't become this 
this like so intensive where everyone is waiting to pounce. So I think that's one, one way to think about it in a maybe a small way about systemic change. I do want to mention one other thing because I don't know that, I know we all do this, but I want to mention it because I think it's important. Um, there's more and more movement on the ground from community activists, from impacted people and families. In New York, we're having, there have been rallies out in front of the governor's office um, like every three months. The governor's home, there was a clemency rally, piping in the voices of people inside who were calling at that time. There's a project in, with the lifers and long-termers at two of New York State's maximum prisons around clemency and their proposals about how to get their voices heard. So I think it's, as we think about the work we're doing, and I know everybody on this call knows that, but I think it's important to look at the people inside as well as their families on the outside. And, and Steve, everything you've brought up is really um, brought, come back to your earlier point that clemency is an obligation. It's not just a grant of mercy or grace, but it's something that governors and executives ought to feel compelled to do as part of their job. So, so thinking about the really, um, the way that these processes weigh on our clients and on, I know Steve, you, and lots of folks on this call work with law students and pro bono attorneys. How do you talk to your clients and to the folks you are working with about odds? How do you manage expectations given what we know about this process? I would say aside from you know, deciding which cases to take, the conversations about managing expectations are also among the most difficult. I mean, the, the reality is for many of our clients, they were gone, but forgotten, you know? They, nobody had really given a second thought to them. They were living in, you know, living out death by incarceration or 35, 40 year sentences with all their appeals already exhausted. And then someone comes into the picture and says, you know, we're willing to fight for you. Um, but the chances of winning in the clemency process are small. They're, I mean, there's just no ands, ifs, or buts about it. So I think that's a conversation you have from the beginning. You know, I believe in you. I, I believe that you deserve a second chance. I'm willing to fight for that second chance and to keep fighting for that second chance. This is not going to be a quick fix. This may be something that we're in, in it for the long haul. Uh, don't despair. Um, you know, all of those things are regular parts of my conversations with clients, but, you know, it doesn't mean that they and their family members aren't calling you on a regular basis for any little bit of information about their cases. Um, you know, it's been very dispiriting to tell clients, you know, um, that they need to sort of buckle down and wait out an election year because, you know, um, that's just a political ra reality that, that we have to deal with. Um, that is something that's really hard for them and their families to understand. But it's a conversation and it's, it's one that we have to have and we have to have it in the beginning, um, from the very beginning and over and over again. I, I, I don't know that I have anything. Or Steve, were you done? Looks like I'm you're done. I'm done. I, I don't have anything much to add to what Steve um, just said, but what I will say is for those of you who understandably dread those conversations because they are hard, remember this, even when we don't get our people out on, on the time frame that we wanna get them out uh, of prison on, know these two things first first i mean first the fight doesn't have to end you can figure out how to keep going but second just showing up for our clients and being there with them and visiting them it matters it matters it reaffirms their humanity and even if we don't accomplish the the ultimate goal on the timetable that we want, we make a difference. And I don't, I think um, younger lawyers, actually lawyers who are gray in the beard as I am, 
sometimes forget that. And that's an important um, thing to always remember. So true. I can't tell you how many times I get a phone call from a client, you know, since we last spoke two months ago, this is what I've been doing. You know, I mean, it's like the work doesn't stop for them. They want to keep evolving and demonstrating to you and the governor that their application needs to be taken seriously. Um, so that, that's very true. Yeah, I, I have a, a, a letter from a client that I keep on my bulletin board who had reached out um, for help with clemency and his is a hard case. He's not the exceptional you know, degree earning but is an extraordinary guy. And I just wrote back and I said, you know, it's a long arduous uphill path to clemency. And he wrote back, it's really two sentences. He says, yeah, but it begins with a first step. It's like, okay, so that was three years ago. Um, and yeah, we're in touch all the time. I, I also want to emphasize something that, 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 that David and Steve were just talking about. And, and Jenny, I don't know if this is where you wanted to go with this, but you know, it, it's um, every year. So I said, I get 30, 35 new students every January and we take on new cases, new clemency cases and the students every year, there's an issue about, oh, so what happened with last year's crew? How many people came home? Mm -hmm. And well, last year, the answer was none. The one person who got clemency was actually filed three years before. And so inevitably, we all kind of think, my colleagues and I, we think, is this, should we be doing this? Are we raising false hope? Is there something cruel about this? And I, you know, I mentioned Judy Clark before, the first person who I worked with on clemency. Judy came to our first class and was asked that question, you know, because she had been trying for clemency for close to 10 years. And the question was put to her, so, you know, is there, what's the value when you don't get clemency? What's, what's the worth? What should we all be thinking? And she was the one, and who better to speak than someone who's gone through this, but to say it's important, the work you do is important, it has value, it has meaning, it makes people feel valued, feel, feel recognized to have been stashed away, you know, sometimes near the Canadian border in New York case. So it's, um, that motivates us to some degree. You know, I know it's cold comfort in many ways, but it's real. I'll just mention real quick one story. I think I've said this to some of you before. There's a client of ours we've been working with for four years now who got 50 to life when he was 16. And New York's one of those truth and sentencing states. He'll see the board when he's 66. And um, every 20, December 25th at the end of the year, he says, so I guess it's not my time yet. And we say, well, you know, his name is Craig Jackson. I said, well, you know, we'll keep supplementing. And he wrote me this letter after one of our uh, last calls where he said, you know, I carry around my clemency application with me everywhere I go in here. And I show it to my peers, to the volunteers, to other people in the prison. And when they read it and they step back and they say, wow, this is you. He said that that matters to me. That matters to me. And again, it feels like cold comfort, but um, this is, I guess, for people who are listening, who are thinking about this work and saying, is, is it worth it if you don't bring someone home? It is. It is. And that's not from us. That's from the people we work with. Yeah. And I think, I think that ties in right with, with sort of what I was talking about at the beginning too, about like the forgottenness that you just can't, you cannot, it's really hard to, to under or to oversell, I don't know which direction, but it's really hard to, uh, it, it, like if you haven't worked with somebody and just totally lost and had them, like you just like, you know, you're in federal court and you get creamed and the jury finds nothing for you or you sit, you know, the governor pays no attention to your clemency and the person still feels good about what you did for them. It, it's really hard to, to emphasize enough that just how much people feel forgotten and how much not feeling forgotten means on its own. And this isn't to say don't win, like win, get them out. Like, but, but again, ju just, I, I really, that, that's the, that's the, that's the comforting thing is, is that like, we're always going to try to do our best, but even if you don't, the doing of your best does mean something to all of us. Yeah. Well, it's embarrassing to cry on a panel that you're moderating, but so you have it. <laughs> um, that's what's happening right now. Um, you know, I've, I've, a lot of questions I want to follow up with that, but given that I'm trying to hold it together, I'm going to ask one that was in the chat and then we'll circle back to some broader and sort of more hopeful future looking questions. 
Um, but someone in the chat raised a very good point that many successful positions really focus on higher education, on really specific achievements that are linked to traditional sort of out of prison achievements, PhD programs, bachelor's programs, um, and that many folks who are incarcerated might either not have access to that kind of education or might not be in a position to make use of that education. People come into prison with really different starting points and um, strengths and weaknesses. How do you navigate somebody who hasn't been able to take advantage of those kinds of traditional markers, markers of rehabilitation? And how do you tell those kinds of stories in a way that's compelling? I mean, I'd say it's just a focus on other stuff then, right? Like um, one of our juvenile folks is is just that's that, that you know what the what the question asked describes him to a t uh one of these clemency one a, a clemency applicant and but he's got a great supportive family and he is a different person than he was and he all indications from his application are even though he has not gotten a bachelor's degree that he's very unlikely to commit a crime ever again and so you just have to focus if for from where I sit, like you just have to focus your narrative and your application on something other than look at this guy with a, you know, a BA in, uh, you know, philosophy from NC State or whatever it is, you know, I, I just, so, you, and, and that's true, but you're right, you're always tailoring your, your narrative and your application. And so that's, this is just another uh, instance of that. Yeah, we struggle with that as well, too. We do this exercise every so often where we go around the room as the students are beginning to get their know, to know their clients. And we just say, look, we're not reducing someone to two or three sentences, but in two or three sentences, this person deserves clemency because like what, what is the what's the, the heart of it? What's the and, you know, I, I always hesitate to say that because it does feel so reductive, you know. Yes. But, I'm, but I'm reminded when we first began, and, and Jenny, you mentioned this, you know, you try and make someone come to life in text is so hard, right? How do you make somebody feel? We began to get um, to do video interviews and really relying on our friends from Witness. I don't know if anybody's familiar with witness.org. They're wonderful. Um, and they worked with us about how to, how to create video advocacy. And the first person we filmed, we had three hours of footage. And we were all thinking, this is incredible. It's like, we're gonna have like a 60 minute documentary that we're sending to the governor. Good and luck said, with oh. that. Yeah, they said, okay, <laughs> we're gonna make this a five minutes. He said, five minutes, five minutes. And you know, at first, my first reaction is cynical. Like, oh yeah, the governor's office, you're right. They'll only give us five minutes, but it's basically all of our collective attention spans. You know, the, one of the first clemency applications, I'm embarrassed to say this, we submitted was 499 pages. Okay. Who's going to read, you know? <laughs> so yes, if someone has these degrees where you can emphasize that, um, that's wonderful, but it, it's, and I know this isn't much of an answer, but there's a there there for each and every one of us um, that we can find in other ways. Just one quick example, and this is again, taking the cues from people inside, people who are formerly incarcerated. One of the people we worked with early on, we thought, okay, what is there here? He's done all the required programs. He did a couple of others. And it was almost in passing that he mentioned that he was in charge of the children's center. And we thought, oh, okay, that's nice. You're in charge of the children's center. And then he mentioned, yeah, I'm the only person the superintendent picked me. And we thought, whoa, we didn't realize that. So instead of a one sentence, not even a sentence, just a little thing, it became a something we wanted to develop, like learning which programs take more time and effort. You know, what are, what, you know, someone has different privileges uh, to kind of make up for, but because the question is exactly spot on. I know the ones we work with, they want to know what college degrees, what, you know, and that will rule out a lot of people unless we get really creative and forceful. An interesting note from our own juvenile sentence review board, the board members asked advocates to stop sending in every certificate the person had earned. They're like, just give us a list. We believe you. Because <laughs> that's what gets yeah. you a 500 page submission. <laughs> that is a good practical tip for those watching. Don't submit hundreds of pages because no one will look at them. Um, I guess I just, I want to throw in, we had a client who was serving a natural life sentence. He'd been in for 36 years and he'd spent 35 of them in protective custody. 
So he hadn't done anything because he couldn't, he just couldn't do anything. But he had this incredibly rich literary life. He read everything, just everything. And not stuff, you know, that an English professor would be necessarily excited about, but he like loved the time novels he loved and he loved the books he loved. And so we we spent, you know, 10 pages talking about his favorite books and what he pulled from them. And his petition was granted and he is home. I mean, it's great. Okay. Um, yay, yay to everyone who is, who is doing this work. So we only have a couple of minutes left yet um, with during this panel. And I, I, I guess I wanna end on a hopeful note. I think there's been a lot of hope and a lot of um, incredibly powerful conversations about why we're doing this work. I wanna think about the future a little bit um, and recognizing that we've talked about clemency as a way to signal the values that we hold. Um, I guess I want each of you to talk just for a couple of minutes about what you hope to accomplish with clemency, both for your clients, but also for the criminal legal system and our very broken civil society as a whole. Um, it's a narrow question, no pressure. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna, <laughs> how about I send it to Steve D first because you, you're smiling, so you seem receptive. <laughs> All right, sure. I don't know if this directly answers the question, but you know, I, I'm reminded of, um, several years ago going to an event when the Innocence Project in New York was really first when, when Barry Sheck and company were starting it. There was some event, I can't remember where we were, we were in some room and they had an exoneree, one of the first speak. And part of it was about fundraising, but it was also about bringing attention to the problem of how many people are wrongfully convicted. And it moved hearts and minds. And to me, the more people who do get clemency and who are, introduced not only to their families and repairing the harm that's been done over the last you know, 40 years, but I, I, I just said, you know, our governor commuted the sentences of 41, our former governor, the Cuomo, 41 people in 11 plus years. He had thousands of applications. Um, knowing a lot of those folks, um, I know this, I, I'm just looking forward to, especially post COVID, getting all 41 together in a room together with a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of people because uh, I think they can make the case for broader clemency better than anybody. Um, you know, I think I, I really am hoping that the um, that as we as we build these systems and see success that that we I, I agree with uh, changing hearts and minds. <laughs> I, I don't know, for me, it's a more sort of like limited scale that I'm thinking about. But just, you know, I. I did some digging into old um, old rates of pardon and commutation in North Carolina and used to be just a regular part of the executive function and it's just not anymore. And I think that, um, you know, I so so to me, it's the sort of movement aspect here is to just demonstrate that it's not all Willie Horton, it's not all the end of the world, and it's not something you need to have as this... Um, as this sort of boogeyman aspect, you know, where it's just like, this is terrifying. It doesn't have to be terrifying. It should be a regular part of your job as the chief executive of the state to take a look at the state's criminal justice system and say, is this functioning the way we want it to? And what can I do about it? I mean, it's literally part of your job. Um, and I understand that it's, um, you know, that it's, it, it's, it might not be your favorite part of the job, but we all have parts of our job that are not our favorite parts of our job. And it doesn't mean we don't get to do them if we want to be good at our jobs. So, um, you know, I also try to remind myself that, you know, frankly, criminal justice and particularly clemency is a relatively small part of any governor's portfolio and forget about being a governor during COVID. Like there's not a job I really want a lot less than trying to like run a state during a global pandemic. Um, so I, I want to, you know, recognize that it's a, it, there's a lot on people's plates and they have a lot of things to think about, but then just do our best to sort of in a gentle, and as gentle a way as we can remind them that, that this is in our constitutions and they are responsible for it. And, and they can, I mean, and, and that they can affect large scale change if they want to. 
you know, if I were the governor, we you, we would all be able to bring categorical clemency requests to me, which may in fact be why I'm not the governor, <laughs> because that's not the thing right now that people are voting for. But nevertheless, you can affect huge change. And so um, just convincing them that that's uh, a, a good and um, achievable thing to do is, is is where I'm trying to head. I think, Ben, if you run for governor on a pro-clemency campaign, we will all come to our knock for you. Yeah. yeah, I mean, listen, if I become the governor, we're all j just like the petition, just line them up, you know, I'm ready. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> David, how about you? me up. North Carolina is my home state, so I, I'll be there to, to fight for you. Um, <laughs> we're all familiar with Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, quote, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I'm gonna quibble with that quote just for on one little point. That arc doesn't just bend on its own. It bends because we make it bend. We bend it towards justice. And in this space where we are working to free people um, who are overpunished for violent crimes, either using clemency, parole, or some other creative way, we bend that arc over time through the stories that we tell. And our abilities to tell stories gives us power. And that power is why, why I choose to be hopeful about our ability to, to make a difference uh, in this space for people who really need it. And I'll just go back to what, what Steve Zeidman said at the beginning, which is um, we really have Part of the reason I do this work is we have to change society's expectations about what is appropriate punishment for criminal behavior, especially violent criminal behavior. Um, when I started doing this work 30 years ago, and I, people may be, you know, people have done it even before longer than I have, you know, the before truth and sentencing. You know, the, the average length of a sentence for a murder was something like 14 years. Now, maybe to some people that was too low. I don't know, it, you know, but for me, what we've done since then is just insanity. You know, it's mandatory minimums, 20 to 60 years, truth in sentencing, 100%, throw in another 15 years for gangs, throw in another 15 years for guns. Um, make sentences mandatorily consecutive, three strikes and you're out. And so we have people who are serving these soul crushing sentences without any opportunity for a second look. And what else did we do? We abolished parole. I mean, parole is essentially the second look option that the system always had, at least had for years and years and years. Um, so we have to get people accustomed to this notion that it's worth taking a second look at these folks. And clemency cases is the way to do that. Every time we bring someone out and they succeed, uh, it's an opportunity to push back against the narrative. And it's simply okay to throw away large quantities of mostly black and brown people without even a second Thought. Incredibly well said. Clemency is the tool that we have to really inject mercy and grace back into a system that has created people as resourceful for far too long. Well, guys, we are at time. Thank you all so much. You've inspired me more than you know. I think you've probably inspired everyone who's listened to you and everyone who's lives in touch. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your expertise and your hope with us all. Hi, everybody. <laughs>